We've been talking now for the last nine weeks um, about, our, about our mission, right? And it's right up here on the screens that Summit Church exists to know, love, and follow Jesus and to help others do the same, right? And so we spent three weeks on knowing Jesus for ourselves. We spent three weeks on loving Jesus for ourselves, our affections for him and worshiping him and him alone, not sitting on the fence like the church at Laodicea, but not being lukewarm, but to be on fire for the person and work of Jesus, right? For ourselves. And then, and then we've spent the last three weeks on following Jesus, and now we're going to spend three weeks on helping others do the same. And i got a confession to make now that, we're, now that we're here in week 10. I can finally say this and speak this. These first nine weeks have been really hard to come with messages focused solely on loving Jesus yourself, on knowing Jesus for you, on following Jesus for you, because Most of the texts and most of the things that I've studied and that I've read include others. Because Jesus, when he came to this earth, when he stepped out of heaven, Philippians 2, right, took on the form of a servant, right, when he he stepped out of heaven, he was so unashamedly, unapologetically, unequivocally focused on the others. He was others-minded. Now, I want you to think about that in comparison to what we see around today. Do we see many others-minded people? Right? When's the last time you stood in a line? Right? And I was was standing in a line recently. Um, Well, let's just name it. Okay, it was summer last week. We had a week of summer. I've already mentioned that. Right? I was at Beals. Okay? <laughs> Confession. Okay? Um, I was at Beals, and uh, it, was after, it was after a softball game, and so we, we were standing there, and, 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 and at, at Beals, you know, a lot of these ice cream establishments, right? You just, you're just kind of trusted to form your own line. Be adults and form your own line. And so I was standing there, and I was, I was kind of standing in the middle, and there were two windows of folks that were taking orders, and I was kind of standing in the middle waiting for the next one. Now, uh, some of you, if you get skipped, you rise to that occasion, right? You rise to that occasion, and you will step in there and say, oh, no, 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 hold up. Now, I'm next. Me, if I'm skipped... You can blame the South in me. You can blame whatever. But I'm just like, oh, they probably wanted it more. They probably deserved it more. They probably needed it more. You just, you just go on ahead and I will wait my turn. But inwardly, I'm like, hey! <laughs> Get back! Do you not see the line that is being formed right here? And like, So inwardly, I'm enraged. But outwardly, I'm like, it's all good. All good. Just going to wait my turn, right? Just going to wait my turn. And there were two groups of people, and I'm not just saying like one or two people. I'm talking like five or six people that just slid right in front of me Wednesday night at Beals. And so I, and I went off of, here it is, Jeff. I went off of caffeine this week. This is day six of me not being on caffeine. So if I'm a little more angry this morning, Okay, then, then that explains it, right? People are saying that this is going to be really good for me. You just wait. You just wait. And I'm like, I Googled how long, right, these side effects last. And they're like two to nine days. And I'm like, day six? Come on, God, help me, please. Right, day six. Anyway, so, so this is Wednesday night. This is like day three. And so I'm a really angry, upset person. And these people are skipping me and standing in the way of me and my ice cream, Right? And I had the thought, when it comes to Beals, Papa's, Field of Choice, all of the local ice cream establishments that are equally as great, equally as expensive and overpriced, and mostly equally portioned, I had the thought, it is every person for themselves out here when it comes to ice cream. 
It is. Every person for themselves. Same thing on 495 in Massachusetts, right? It is. Every person for themselves on that interstate, right? Hallelujah. I'm seeing these hands. We're touching a cord this morning. We're about to give an altar call. And we might pass a plate this morning. <laughs> right? But that is not what, 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 we've, what, what I've come to realize, and what I'm sure you've come to realize too, is that, is that knowing, loving, following Jesus, and helping others do the same, that's not the natural instinct for each and every one of us. Right? M- most of us, some of us are better at it than others, being others-minded, Right? But when it comes down to it, that is not the natural inclination for us to, to place others as more significant than ourselves, like the scripture talks about. And I want us to see today how Jesus un, like, undoubtedly, unashamedly made everything that he was about about others. And Ephesians 5, 1, as we've quoted many times throughout this series, imitate Christ, therefore, as his dear children. He sets the model for us when it comes to being others-minded. Listen to this uh, quote by Pope Francis. Um, it says, Our mission as Christians is to conform our lives ever more to Jesus as the model of our lives. That's it. You don't have to, like, like if we look at this quote right here, leave that up there for a few minutes, Ken. If we look at this quote right here, that can be the full existence of our Christian life. If you're in here this morning with a struggling marriage, look at this quote. If you're in here this morning struggling with a, 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 a child or a teenager or, or, or a young adult and you're a parent, right, look at this quote. If you're struggling this morning in here and you're searching for a church, a body of Christ, look at this quote. If you're in here this morning, you're struggling in your job, look at this quote. If you're in here this morning and you're bored because you just retired and you don't know what to do with your life and you're driving everybody around you crazy and insane, look at this quote, right? That our mission as believers in Jesus, as believers in Christ, is to conform our lives. We talked about that recently. Don't conform any longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? To conform our lives ever more to Jesus as the model of our lives. That as we approach our marriage, if I try everything that I possibly can to be as much like Jesus as I can be, that's all I can do. As a, as a parent, if I try everything in my power to conform my life to Jesus, that's all I can do. As a church member, as a church attender, if I try everything in my power to worship Him and Him alone and not fight for my preferences and wrong opinions, that's all I can do. As an employee or employer, if I fight with everything I can to be more like Jesus, That's all I can do. That's all I can do. And as a dad right now, the conversation I'm having a lot with my kids or with kids that I'm around on sports teams and different things like that, right, is to only control what you can control. I cannot control the crazy people that are cutting in line of a caffeine-deprived, hungry, ice cream-addicted person at Beals. I can't control them. I can't control the people that cut me off on 495. I can't control the people, right? But I can control how I react to it. I can control how much like Jesus I want to be in response to that situation. And so this is huge for us, and this sets us up for the entire message today. That our mission, knowing, loving, following Jesus, and helping others to do the same, is to conform our lives ever more to Jesus as the model of our lives. To conform our lives ever more to Jesus as the model of our lives. Let's look at Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. You all right? You ready? One. All right. Luke chapter 19, verse 1. He entered Jericho, the he being Jesus, and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, 
Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. Why was the tree so sick? All right. A little man named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector. If, you, if you've never heard that song before, our VBS is coming up, and you need to be there. Okay? He was a chief tax collector, was rich, and he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, Hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now, I want you to see how awkward that would be, right? You're in the Memorial Day parade, right? And you're and you're and you're watching the Memorial Day parade, and all of a sudden someone's walking by in the parade and they look and they say, Hey, Matt, hurry up! I'm coming to your house this afternoon and I'm gonna stay. I'm gonna stay for an undetermined amount of time. Right? That's all we see, right? Hurry up, come down, Zacchaeus. You don't know me, right? I don't know you, but I'm calling you out of the sycamore tree, and I'm coming to your house today. What's our response? Nine one one. <laughs> Green button, right? <laughs> right? But obviously, there was some familiarity. We'll get we'll get more to that in just a moment. Okay. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Received him joyfully. Verse 7, and when they saw it, they all grumbled. Who's the they? The religious people, right? The, 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 that, were, that were celebrating Jesus as he came into town. As they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. Hmm. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, it's hard for me to move past verse 10, but I want to back up. I want to give you some context around this, because if we look closely and examine the life and ministry of Jesus, then we'll take notice that he came to seek out the outcasts of society, right? Because as Christians, we're called to continue the mission of Jesus. We talked about that, right? As Christians, we're called to to continue the mission of Jesus, and so if we're going to, then we've got to look at what Jesus did here, and first we see that Jesus came for the outcast. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he was very rich. I love that. Right? He was very rich, much like Danny's going to be when he goes to SMC for engineering, and he's going to come back and pay off this building. It's going to be awesome. Right? Right, Danny? All right, very good. You heard it here, folks. Right? He was rich. Luke is the only one of the four gospel writers that tell the story of Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Dr. Luke, he was very attention to detail, very detailed. Uh, He's the only one of the gospel writers to mention this encounter, to mention the encounter of Jesus and Zacchaeus. And what makes it so important is that Zacchaeus was indeed a tax collector. Why is it so important? I'm glad you asked. Because tax collectors were hated. They were hated by the Jews because they were collaborators with the Romans. Okay, they were, they were collaborators. If you've ever seen The Chosen, I'm not saying The Chosen is Bible, but they do a beautiful job. They do a beautiful job bringing the hatred of the tax collector to life. Right? They do a beautiful job of that. Um, and, and, and it just kind of gives, if you're a visual learner, I recommend it because it just kind of gives you the picture in your mind of what Zacchaeus, how he would have been seen by the people around him. Right? And how if Zacchaeus is up in this tree and Jesus is passing through and Jesus calls him out of everyone in the town, how much grumbling that indeed would have, would have erupted and would have stirred. Right? 
And so they, they collected taxes for the Romans, tax collectors did, but they had the authority to collect more than was required by Rome and would therefore pocket the extra money. Okay? They had the authority to raise that price so that they could pocket the extra money so that they were indeed rich, but they were considered outcasts by the Jews because they exploited their own people. They took advantage of their own people. And so you could go as far as to say that they were grouped with such people as prostitutes and people of disrepute. People did not want to associate with the tax collectors because they were only taking advantage of the people, of their own people, right? And so, but it gets worse. Not only was, it, was Zacchaeus a tax collector, but he was called the chief tax collector. You see where that gets worse? So not only... Would he get cut from, would he raise the prices for himself, but he would get a cut from the other tax collectors? Right? And so he became very rich and was hated and despised more than the other tax collectors. But there's another thing interesting about Zacchaeus. And we've already mentioned it in our song that we sang together a few moments ago. <clears throat> he tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd. I've never had that issue. But I can imagine it's frustrating. Right? I can imagine it's frustrating. He was too short to see over the crowd. Not only was Zacchaeus a tax collector, but he was also a short tax collector. There's so many things I want to say, but we need to I'm not sure they belong in the sermon. And he wanted to get a look at Jesus. He wanted to get a look at Jesus. He had heard about this preacher. From Nazareth, he had heard about his teaching with authority, unlike anyone else. He had also heard that he had healed the blind, he had, heard, he had healed the lame, he had healed the deaf, he had loosened the tongues of the mute. He had heard that Jesus was no ordinary man, that he was kind, of, that he was kind and accepting of those considered as outcasts by the society. He had also heard that Jesus was coming through town and wanted to get a look at him. But he was too short, so he ran ahead climbed into a sycamore fig tree beside the road as Jesus was passing by. Here's something unique about Zacchaeus. He was so hungry. Hear this. He was so hungry for spiritual change that he was willing to go the extra mile for it. He was so hungry for spiritual change that he was willing to go the extra mile for it. Here's why so many of us miss out on the blessing of Jesus, because we're not willing to go the extra mile for it. We're not willing to go the extra mile for it. We miss out, we miss out on the blessing of Jesus because we're not willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of experiencing what God has for us. Right? We're, we're not willing to be inconvenienced. We were at a conference, um, I think it was about a year ago, maybe a little over a year ago, and the mission statement of this conference for churches was that we would intentionally inconvenience ourselves for the sake of others hearing the gospel. When's the last time you woke up and just say, man, how can I intentionally inconvenience myself so that someone may hear about Jesus today? How can I intentionally make myself uncomfortable for the sake of someone else that needs a touch from Jesus hearing Him today? Hearing Him today. And that's exactly what Zacchaeus was doing. He got there he had heard the reputation of Jesus. He had heard that Jesus was going to be coming through town. He's an outcast. No one is turning around and looking at Zacchaeus and saying, hey, slide on up to the front. I can see over you. Right? Slide on up to the front. Nobody's turning around and making room for him because A, they don't think he should be there, and B, they don't, they don't like him. They don't respect him. He's the outcast. And so he goes the extra mile and says, nope, I've got to see Jesus. I've got to experience Jesus. And he runs on ahead and climbs up into a tree. Not knowing, not knowing that Jesus is about to call him out by name. But I want you to see the expectancy. Zacchaeus knew 
Zacchaeus knew, Zacchaeus knew that he had to see Jesus, but he had no idea what was coming. He knew he had to see Jesus, but he had no idea what was coming. Many of us are eager to get to Jesus, but we've got our list of what we need him to do for us. Instead of just coming to Jesus and saying, all right, Jesus, here I am. What do you want? What do you, what do you want from me? Where, where do I need to be? What do you, we've, we've got it all, and we're just asking him to place his stamp of approval and blessing on it instead of saying, Jesus, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? Right? And so Zacchaeus intentionally goes the extra mile. And what it, it was like, I mean, the sycamore tree, the sycamore tree, excuse me, was very plentiful in Palestine, and in fact still is today, like an oak tree, okay, but with a short trunk and very substantial and wide-spreading limbs, full tree, right, full tree. So short trunk, full tree, okay, so easily, I mean, you would look at that tree if you were on a trail or something and say, yep, that's, that's a tree I want to climb, right, that's a climbable tree, right, and you, some of you are like, Oh, but you might hurt yourself. No, 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 no. We're not that kind of church. Okay, we climb it. Okay? Okay. Wrap in bubble wrap, do whatever you got to do, but send them up. Okay? <clears throat> Sycamore tree was very plentiful. Okay, like an oak tree. But what a, great, what a great stroke of luck here for Ezekiel. He got lucky. Because Jesus was coming by, and maybe it wasn't such luck, Maybe it was the providence of God. Right? For the sovereign Lord who brings the outcasts of Israel says, I will bring others too besides my people Israel. Isaiah 56, 8. See, it's easy to talk to certain people about Jesus. It's harder to talk to other people about Jesus. But the reality is there's tons of people who don't fit into our comfort zones and are dying without ever hearing the truth of Jesus. Without ever hearing the truth of Jesus. There are people who, believe it or not, as cool as we are, there are people that are not like us, that need Jesus desperately. And so we need to come to grips with the fact that our mission is to reach out to the outcasts of society because, that, because believe it or not, that's the reason we're here. That's the reason we're here. To be others-minded for the outcast. Number two, Jesus came for the hopeless. Jesus came for the hopeless. Here we see a notorious sinner in Zacchaeus. Look at verses 4 and 5. Climbed up to a sycamore tree, and when Jesus came to the place, verse 5, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry down, for I must stay at your house today. For I must stay at your house today. The vast difference between religious people and real Christians is great. It's great. Religious people are all about appearances, while believers in Jesus are about the, are about the kingdom and reaching the lost. Right? That's why, that's why I love, I, mm, 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 yeah, that's why I love this space. Because we didn't build this space to be a sanctuary of idol worship. Where it became more about our comforts. We bought nice chairs with the seat back pockets. And we got 40 that have arms on them because we heard that some of you would leave the church if we didn't. <laughs> but I, I love, we, we were, I love, I love, I love that 90 to 95% of this building has multiple uses. This is not a place where we can just gather on Sunday morning. You know why we did that? In case you're visiting and you're checking us out today. We built this for the community. We didn't build this, build this for us. And we said along the way that we're building our outreach tool so that people would come in and see this place and see this space and might just ask questions about what we're about. And might just inquire about what is this thing that you do on Sunday mornings. Well, let me tell you. 
So we don't have a deep stage that's four feet high with a baptistry built into it and jets. That'd be sweet. <laughs> right? Come to church with the t-shirt cannon and if you're sitting in a certain row, you can sit in the hot tub during the service. <laughs> right? Doesn't sound like a professional studio in here. But you're here. I'm here, the Bible's here, and God's people are gathered for worship. Do we need anything else? I told him, leave the roof off. (laughs) Open air worship. Right? Open air worship. I love that. Right? Jesus came for the hopeless, right? The religious... They're concerned about appearances. They're concerned about their comforts. They're concerned. And and while followers of Jesus, they're all about the kingdom and reaching the lost. Guess which one of those groups Jesus was in? Not the religious leader. And we can see it clearly in verse 5 where Luke tells us that when Jesus came by, he looked up to into the tree and said, Zacchaeus, come on down. We're going to your house. We're going to your house. I'm going to stay there. I'm going to be with you. I'm going to come into your home today. Notice how Jesus deals with the most notorious sinner in the community, the outcast from society. He doesn't call him on the carpet, announce judgment on him, or condemn him for his many sins, or tell him he shouldn't wear that in church. Right? He says, come down. Quickly! With haste! Right? Because I must be a guest in your home today. Jesus knew that if he was going to call Zacchaeus to change, he had to build a relationship first. He had to build a relationship first. Now, again, we've talked about this. For most people, if someone you've never met announces that they're coming to dinner and they're going to spend the night Would you say to them, oh really? Awesome. You're extra special, aren't you? Come on. He jumps down, Zacchaeus does, with joy and excitement and says, come on Jesus, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. How divine of an appointment for this to be. There's something going on within his heart that caused his desire for spiritual renewal to take place in him. Right? There's, the, there's, the, there's that desire in his heart. And when it happens for you, I'm sure, I'm sure you've felt that before, that you just, you, just need, you just need a renewal in your heart. You just need something. And so you'll go the extra mile. But here you see how the religious people respond. They're not concerned with the prospect of a sinner coming to repentance. Right? We would love to sit and think, That, oh, those people, they went and got the Baptist, they went and got the towel. They went and got everything ready because they knew that Zacchaeus was going to come out of that house different than when he went in, right? The religious people should have, and we can sit on this side and talk about it and, and say it and name it, right? They should have said, yes, this is awesome. Zacchaeus is going to be set free in Jesus. We need to make preparations for a celebration that when he comes out of the house after encountering Jesus, we celebrate because he's now going to be one of us and he's going to give us all our tax money back. Right? But what'd they do? Why not me? Right? I'm more deserving. I've followed you. I've done this. I've been that. I've served here. I've, I've, I've done all of these things and so I should have been the one to host Jesus. I should have been the one. And they let themselves and their selfishness and their single-mindedness on themselves get in the way of missing, get in the way of experiencing a beautiful Jesus moment for Zacchaeus. They grumbled. They grumbled. They didn't see Him for what He could be. All they saw was what he had been. 
And if, you're, if you've ever been on that side of it, if you've ever gone through a season of brokenness, right? If, if you look at the person that you've become now, Christian, after five years, ten years, and you go and you see somebody that you haven't seen for 15 years, right? We, we, can, we can talk about it, right? But, but isn't, isn't it hard? Isn't it hard to shift that perspective and see that person for who they've come to be? But if you're that person, how hard is it when people just hang your past over your head? And say, you, you can never, you could never be this. Right? You would never be the person that Jesus would call out of a tree. I've got way more time than you. I've got way more sheets of paper on my wall than you do. Saying that I'm qualified, whatever that means, to stand up here and talk on Sunday mornings. Right? And you're, and you're just not there. Look at what you did six months ago. You're not, at the, you're not at the level that I am. You don't deserve this in the same way that I do. And Christian, listen to me. Church person, listen to me. Follower of Jesus, listen to me. If you ever play the ranking game and look across the aisle and say, oh, I've got it on that person, you're missing the mission of Jesus. If you ever sit and think to feel better about yourselves, about what they did, a sin that they committed five years ago, and think to yourself, well, at least I'm not as bad as that person, you're missing the mission of Jesus. Because what you're saying is they're hopeless and you're not. And the truth is, we're all hopeless unless Jesus calls us out of the tree. We are all an outcast unless Jesus calls us out of the tree. Whew, I told y'all I was going to be angrier this morning. Y'all are going to go to Kristen after the service. Please put him back on caffeine. Please. Please. Number, number three. Number three. We got to move. We got to move. We got to move. Jesus also came for the lost. Look at verses 7 through 10. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. He was others minded. Zacchaeus stood before the Lord. Obviously, not everybody's excited, right? But we see that with Jesus, there's no hopeless cases. He came to save and redeem the hopeless cases. And we see in this text, people who are more interested in the appearance rather than someone seeing someone come to Christ. But as a sign of a transformed heart, which I would love, I would love if Dr. Luke would have been able to Sneak into the house, wouldn't you? I'd love to know what they ate. I don't, that's, that's just how my mind goes. When I, when I see the upper room and all of that, and I, I, would, I would have just loved to have more detail about the encounters and the small conversations and the dad jokes that Jesus would have told. You know, because I know they were good. I would have loved to have seen more detail about this conversation, but we don't get it. Why don't we get it? Because we don't need it. Because God's work on an individual is personal. Right? God's done some things in your life. God's done some things in my life. We'll never, we'll never share. Right? Some encounters that were so personal, so intensely personal, right? They're mine. And that's what I love about God is He's such a personal God that He will work and deal with each one of us so personally that we don't need the details of how it happened. We don't need the nitty gritty of that conversation. Right? But what we get is the outcome. What we get is the outcome. Jesus came for the lost. And so as a sign of His transformed heart, 
Zacchaeus announced that he's giving half of what he owns to the poor. And he remember, remember that he's an exceedingly wealth, wealthy person, wealthy man. And in addition to that, if he's cheated anyone, and he's probably cheated a bunch of people, that he would give back to them four times as much as he cheated. He would not only give back everything he cheated of, but, but give them back twice as much, even with interest, and then give them twice as much as that. Talk about putting where your mouth is. Putting your money where your mouth is. And listen to this. Listen to this. Okay? I was talking with somebody recently about performance. And performance has come, become a bad word. Right? And in the context of how most of us use the word performance, it's justified. Right? Because we don't want any performance without any depth. Right? And many of us can buy into this type of Christianity that's just all about performance. It's all about the smiling face. It's all about the acting. Right? Let's call that acting. That we come here, we put on a mask, we put on a smiling face, and we pretend for 90 minutes a week that we love Jesus. Right? But as I was talking to this friend, he said, we've got to redeem the word performance. Because so many of us are walking around this, with this salvation that we're doing nothing with to bless others. Jesus calls it fruit in other places. And how do you tell the health of a tree? By its fruit. And so we've got to redeem this word performance because some of us need to wake up and perform. Right? We've been given a jersey to sit on the bench of a team, but the coach is looking at us and saying, hey, I want to put you in. I want you to go in and play, and I want you to sub out so-and-so. And you're like, no, 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 no. I'm not here to play. I'm just here for the jersey. I, 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 want, to, I want to be in the chants, the before and after game speeches. But in the game, I am very content with right here. I'm very content with warming up this seat. I don't, I don't need to get in the game, coach. That, that person should get in the game. It's their turn. I've already played in so many games that it's time for someone else to go and play and have the experience. And if I'm a coach, I'm looking at them and saying, are you still breathing? Well, yeah. Get in the game. Get in the game. Get in the game. Get in the game. And so... Jesus responds to his performance here, right? His fruit. Half of my goods I'm going to give to the poor. If I've defrauded anyone, I'm going to restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Now, not, be not, not because of the things that he had done, but because of the change of heart. That we can get really lost in this text and say, oh, it's a works salvation. I've got to do certain things to earn my salvation. I've got to buy into performance. No, it's not an either or. It's a both and. Out of the fruit of a changed heart comes the adoption of the mission of Jesus. Whew! That was good. Somebody write that down. Tweet that. <laughs> right? Right? The fruit of a changed heart is the adoption of the mission of Jesus. Okay, But the changed heart has to come first. The changed heart has to come first. Okay, Jesus didn't tell him he had to give back everything. Jesus didn't set those guidelines, at least not that we can see. And I believe if he would have said that, would have set those guidelines, we would have seen that in Dr. Luke's transcription of what happened. But we don't. Okay, Jesus didn't demand those things. Jesus came for people like Zacchaeus. He was lost and living in sin, and Jesus came and had a divine encounter with him. And Jesus invited, excuse me, Zacchaeus invited him, Jesus into his home, kind of responded to Jesus self-inviting himself into his home. But he, he welcomed him into his home and his heart. And the result was his life was changed forever. Our mission as Christians is to conform our lives ever more to Jesus as the model of our lives. What was Jesus' mission? He came for the outcasts, the hopeless, and the lost. What's the point? That if we are truly going to be followers of Jesus, 
We need to get out of our comfort zone and seek and save the lost, no matter who they may be and no matter how uncomfortable they make us. God has called us to be others-minded. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says this. I just want to read this to you. It's not going to be on your screen, but as I was thinking this morning and praying this morning, God, how do you want to, how do you want to wrap up the day? How do you want to wrap up the day? This verse has given me much encouragement in dealing with other people for the last seven or eight years. 1 Thessalonians 5, Paul speaking to the church at Thessalonica, and he says, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and, and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. Verse 14, here it is. And we urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, and he could have left this last one out, be patient with them all. I'm going to come back to it. See that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks and all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not despise prophecies, the, pro the proclamation of Scripture, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. And the God of peace Himself will sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. And so 1 Thessalonians 5.14 I want you to think about someone in your life that God has called you to. And ask yourself the question, are they idle? Because Paul says, admonish the idle. What's that look like? Are they faint-hearted? Because Paul tells us to encourage the faint-hearted. The tired. The worn out. How can you encourage someone today that's faint-hearted? Help the weak. Help the weak. Are they weak? And how is God pressing into your heart? Help them. Help them. Help the weak. Help the weak. And then lastly, be patient with them all. Now here, here's what we have to come to grips with. No love follow Jesus and help others do the same. No love follow Jesus and help others do the same. No love and follow Jesus. Okay. That's a process for me. How many of you have completed it? You've got that 100%. You're perfect at knowing Jesus, loving Jesus, and following Jesus every moment of every day of your life. Anybody? Because you're preaching next week if you raise your hand. Okay, exactly. We're all still in process. We're all still in process. And I believe that's what Paul is getting at here when he's telling the church to be patient with everyone among you. Because as you are in process, so are they in process. And this side of heaven, someone, somewhere in this room is going to do something that as the kids say today, triggers you. Right? They're going to. And as, and, as, and, as, and as that happens, you've got to look and say, are they idle? Are they faint-hearted? Are they weak? What's my response in that? But then I've got to be, no matter what, no matter whether they're idle, no matter whether they're weak, no matter whether they're faint-hearted, I've got to be patient with them. Can I tell you something? There are people in this room that I'm so happy were patient with me. 
When God called me to Maine at 26 years old, a 26-year-old know-it-all who would stand up Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and preach because it was what I was supposed to do but had no, no clue what I was doing. And you know what I know now? Much less. <laughs> like, I am the epitome of this verse. I am the epitome of this verse. I told somebody on the lobby, hey, this is day six of no caffeine. You know her response? Oh, how's your wife? <laughs> I said, pray for her. Pray for her. She did this to me. Right? I'm the epitome of this. And if we sit in these seats or stand in this pulpit ever and say, 1 Thessalonians 5.14 does not apply to me, we got to check our heart. Because each one of us could sit here today and say, I'm faint-hearted. Each one of us could sit here today and, today and say, I'm weak. Each one of us could sit here today and say, I'm idle or one of the three. But no matter what, God has called us to be others-minded and patient with each of us. I can't fathom what would have happened if a group of believers at South Coast Community Church had said, man, I don't want to be patient with this guy. Or Summit, I don't want to be patient with this guy anymore. I'm so blessed that they didn't get there. But how many of, how many of the people that we worship with, or maybe ha don't worship with, but we work with, or in our family, we've written them off for the kingdom? Nope, I've got no patience left for you. I've got no patience left for you. Worship team's going to come. Admonish the idol. Call them. Get off the fence. Right? Accountability. Admonish the idol. Encourage the faint-hearted. If you're faint-hearted this morning, listen to me. I love you, and God loves you even more. Keep on going. Look at the text. They call you to perseverance. Look, look, at, look at the joyful text. I mean, I mean, even here, Paul says, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Right? If you're faint-hearted today, I want you to know you are loved. You are deeply, deeply, deeply loved. Admonish the idle. Encourage the faint-hearted. Help the weak. Listen, there's some of you in here that are, that are weak and you can't do what you used to be able to do or there's something that you need to do that you're struggling to, to get done. Have you asked somebody? Have you told somebody? That's something you could put on your Connect card in that seat back pocket in front of you that we spent a lot of money on. And you can drop it in the offering basket and say, hey, I need help with this. We'd love to help you. Guess what? That's the church being the church. We're not a weekly performance of songs and speaking. If that's all this is to you, you're missing it completely. The joy of this time is that we get to gather as the body of Christ, as we've been admonishing the idle, encouraging the faint-hearted, helping the weak. And here it is. No matter what, each and every one of you, be patient with them all. Be patient with them all. Be patient with us. Many, many of you have your top ten lists. Right? Of things you would change about Pastor Travis. <laughs> top 50. <laughs> things you would change about Summit Church. Let me tell you something. Those lists exist everywhere. But if you're concerned about that list more than you're concerned about hearing God's voice on a Sunday morning or, through, or helping one another throughout the week, you're missing the point completely. Amen. I love you. And I want you to get the point and not miss it. Go back to the quote, Ken. Because at the end of the day, for us to be who God has called us to be, it means to conform our lives ever more to Jesus 
And I pray, my prayer for us this morning is that He would convict us of that. God, thank You that Your Word speaks. That Your Word speaks louder than my voice. That Your Word speaks louder than any voice could in here. Thank You that You, like Zacchaeus, have drawn each and every one of us into a tree this morning at Summit. And God, you're walking by the way and you're calling out to each and every one of us and saying, hey, I want to dine with you today. I want to commune with you today. I want to be with you today. I've gone through great lengths to create communion with you and I want to be with you today. Come out of that tree. Let's go talk. Let's go talk. Listen, with every head bowed, every eye closed, we don't do this often enough. But if you're sitting here this morning, you would say, Travis, I'm Zacchaeus. I'm the chief of sinners. And there's some things I need to get right with Jesus today. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand? I'm not going to count to ten or three or make this. We're not playing any music. We're not dragging this out and making this emotional. If that's you today and you say, I need a relationship with Jesus, would you just lift up your hand wherever you're sitting? Anybody at all? Anybody at all? Okay. Anybody else? What about this? Maybe you're sitting here today and you say, Travis, man, Pastor, I'm just, I am faint-hearted. I'm idle. I'm weak and I've been running from Jesus and today I just want to run back to Him. Today I want to sit in the dining room with Him. I need a fresh touch from Jesus. If that's you, I just want to pray. I want to pray that for you today. Would you lift your hand if that's you? Anybody at all? I just want a fresh touch from Jesus, okay? Okay, anybody else? Yeah. Hey, if, that, if that's you, if that's you, listen to me. Just cup your hands right in front of you. I don't know that there's anything special about that, but just symbolically receive this prayer. God, for these, I pray that they would feel your presence today like never before. God, that they would feel your love your goodness, your compassion, your care today. And God, that however you need to do it, whether you need to call them out of a tree, call them out of a job, call them out of a relationship, call them out of whatever, God, that you would give them the peace and the assurance and the strength of knowing that you've got this. You're in control. And that they would trust you. That they would trust you. And so God, we thank you today for who you are. I thank you that you're working miracles in this place and in this state. And we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.